Welcome to Downpour.com's interview series. I'm Malcolm Hillgartner, and today it's my pleasure to be speaking with Adrian McKenty. McKenty is the award-winning and critically acclaimed Irish-born author of the popular Troubles Trilogy, Dead Trilogy, The Young Adult Lighthouse Trilogy, and several standalone adult novels. His full-length debut novel, Dead I Well May Be, was shortlisted for the Ian Fleming Steel Dagger Award, and its sequel, The Dead Yard, was selected as one of the 12 best novels of the year by Publishers Weekly and won the prestigious Audio Award for Best Thriller Suspense Audiobook. McKenty studied politics and philosophy at the University of Oxford in England and also taught high school English in the United States before moving to Australia. His latest novel is In the Morning I'll Be Gone. Blackstone Audio published the audio version, narrated by Gerard Doyle, simultaneously with the hardcover on March 4th, 2014. So, welcome, Adrian. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here. In the Morning I'll Be Gone is book three in the popular Troubles trilogy. And book one, The Cold, Cold Ground, started it out by winning the 2013 Spine Tingler Award for Best Novel. Did you have certain expectations in mind for the trilogy when you sat down to write In the Morning I'll Be Gone? I did. What I really wanted to do was capture that time and place of Belfast in the early 1980s, because when you're growing up there, you perceive the situation to be, as most kids do, I suppose, just to be completely normal. But it wasn't until I'd left Ireland many, many years later when I was describing my childhood to my wife, and she would tell me, that's not well, the way most kids experience life, every morning you would have to go out and look under your car for bombs, or the buses would be searched by the police or the army for bombs. Armed soldiers would be driving through the city or on foot patrol through the city. And then every night there would be riots and explosions, sometimes bomb scares in the school. That was really quite extraordinary. And I'd forgotten all about that. It wasn't until many years later that I realized that was an extraordinary experience and that perhaps I I could capture it in a novel. And the vector I chose for that was crime fiction because it's the genre that I just love the most. So specifically about the Troubles trilogy, just tell us a little bit about the development of the series and the origin of your character, Detective Sergeant Sean Duffy. Sean Duffy is a Catholic member of the RUC, which is the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And at that time, Catholics were extremely rare in the RUC for two reasons. Um, one was institutional. It was basically a Protestant police force. Um, so it was about 90 percent Protestant. They did tr start trying to recruit Catholics in the 1970s and 1980s. But the IRA realized that it would be a huge propaganda coup if they could achieve parity in the Catholic Protestant balance in the police force. And so they put a bounty on the head of all Catholic officers. If you joined the RUC, you were considered to be a traitor. And so the IRA tried to kill basically every Catholic who joined the police. So therefore, recruitment was very low. It was about 10 percent. But I wanted him to be a Catholic because I thought this was going to be so much more interesting if he's one of the very few Catholic police officers and even fewer Catholic detectives. And then I thought, wouldn't it be delicious if I took him, a Catholic boy from the country who's a little bit more middle class, a little bit better educated, he's been to university, and put him in a Protestant town, in a Protestant police force with stolid working class, mostly Presbyterian people around him. And then you'd have all these uh, wonderful fracture lines coming together of class, religion, culture, outlook, and that would make a really interesting frisson, at least for the first book. So Publishers Weekly says... The explosive conclusion to McKinty's Troubles trilogy combines an IRA thriller with a locked room mystery. Though it's the end of the trilogy, readers will hope that this won't be the last they see of Sean Duffy. What do you think is the appeal of this particular character with your readers? Well, he was really fun to write. I mean, I just love this guy who was interested in, in various kinds of music. Definitely a culture vulture in a time when that culture wasn't really appreciated by people he was around or people he was with. So he's into the music that I was into at the time, which was just this classic era of 1970s bands. He's into the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and the Kinks. And this extraordinary period where this 1970 dinosaur rock was 
coming to an end. And these great 1980s bands are starting up like Joy Division and New Order. And he's at the cusp of these two worlds. Plus, he's also been trained in classical music. So I have a lot of 1980s pop culture and musical references, which I think there's a lot of nostalgia for. And I like the fact that he's intersecting with the culture. And I also think he's a bit of a bohemian. He's a bit of a rebel. In the tradition of a lot of police procedurals, he's slightly a rogue cop, but he gets the job done. I mean, I think readers and listeners respect police officers who are intelligent and a little bit devil may care, but who are ultimately professional and who, who are very good at nicking villains. The popular Troubles trilogy is set in Northern Ireland, which is where you were born. What draws you to set your stories there? Oh, it's just such a fascinating place. I mean, it's really extraordinary. On the one hand, you've got this culture where people come and they just go, I don't understand this conflict at all. You've got two groups of people. They're all white. They're all working class. They're all Christians. So why is there such antagonism between them? It just makes no sense. I mean, if you go to somewhere like Syria, it makes sense because you've got Sunni, you've got Shia, you've got Druze, you've got Christians, you've got all these minorities who are to complete different religions, different ethnic backgrounds. And in Bosnia, it makes sense. Sense because you've got all these um, different groups. Even in Ukraine at the moment, you've got you know r religious and geographic and political differences. But in Northern Ireland, it seems to make no sense at all because they're all Christians and they're all white and they're all working class and they all look and talk the same. You cannot tell one group from the other group. And yet Freud has this idea of the narcissism of the small differences. And so you've got this tiny little difference that one group is Catholic and one group is Protestant. And this gets exploded up to be the most important thing in the world. Like I remember when I was a kid there and you'd be walking around and you'd meet some strangers. And the very first thing you would do when you were chatting to them is you'd try and figure out if they were Catholic or they were Protestant. And this stayed with me for years afterwards, after I left Ulster and moved to England or moved to America. You know, I was still trying to figure this out when I suddenly realized, wow, that's not important anymore. It doesn't matter if someone's a Protestant or a Catholic, yet you go back to Belfast and it is important. You're always trying to figure out which of these two groups it comes from. And just this milieu, this extraordinary milieu of riot and this low-level civil war, coupled with this very, very literate culture, this culture where poetry is extremely important. I mean, when I was a kid, we memorized huge reams of poetry, and history is extraordinarily important. So everybody knows their history, and they know their poetry, and everybody can play a musical instrument, and everybody can sing a song. And so there's this extraordinary cultural richness at the same time as this frightening and terrible low-level civil war was going on. I mean, it's just an extraordinary society and an extraordinary culture. And I think readers and listeners have caught on to that, or at least some of them have really been attracted to all these contradictions which were taking place there at that time. Some reviewers have uh, described the genre you write as Irish crime noir. Do you feel that's accurate? I think that there's this burgeoning movement of Irish crime writers that are just coming to the forefront at the moment. You've got to understand the context. It used to be that no one ever wanted to talk about the Troubles. It just was not done. It was a terrible thing that happened for 30 years from 1968 until 1998, 1999. You know, the Troubles were carried on and there was bombings and there were shootings and there was kneecaps. And then in 2000, there was a lot of peace deals with the IRA and with the UVF and with the various groups. And this cone of silence fell and no one really wanted to talk about them anymore. So look, that's the past. Let's forget it. There's this Belfast expression, whatever you say, say nothing. And that descended upon people. No one wanted to talk about it anymore. And when I was starting my writing career, I wrote about anything but Northern Ireland. I wrote about New York, where I'd lived for a decade. And I wrote about Denver, where I'd lived for a long time. I even wrote about Cuba, where I'd been to many, many times. I, I basically wrote about anything but Belfast. But then at the end of the decade, around 2010, 2011, I thought to myself, well, just because no one wants to talk about this or no one wants to write about it, that's maybe the very reason why we should be talking about it and we should be writing about it. So I started writing this series about Sean Duffy and I had the expectation that I wouldn't be able to find a publisher and I wouldn't be able to find an audience. And I was actually quite surprised after the first book that people were interested. And then I noticed around me that I wasn't the only one who had thought this. It was this extraordinary time where people like me who are my generation 
were writing these books that dealt with these issues of the 1970s, 1980s. Friends of mine, people like Brian McGilloway and, and Stuart Neville, Declan Burke and um, Owen McNamee, we'd all just decided subconsciously without planning it that we we're all going to tackle this period. And, and most of these guys were using crime fiction to tackle it. The whole Scottish noir or tartan noir thing has been going strong for the last five, ten years. So I'm hoping that this burgeoning Irish noir or, or Belfast noir movement will get some momentum too. So do you see yourself in any of your characters or stories? Oh, yeah. There's a bit of Duffy in me and there's a bit of me and Duffy, definitely. We share the same taste in music, more or less, although he's a little less tolerant of the Smiths than I am. I'm, I'm actually a big fan of the Smiths, whereas Duffy uh, hates them. I think we share the same recreational choices a lot of the time. We share the same taste in cigarettes, shall we say, and the same choice in booze. And I even have his t-shirt and leather jacket. So there's a lot of me and Duffy. He's a little bit more reckless than I am. I certainly wouldn't do the things that he does. I believe I'm a better driver than he is. He drives rather recklessly um, across the countryside and often doesn't wear a seatbelt. But I also think it's, I think you're, as a novelist, you're in all your characters. I mean, there's even a bit of the villains that I'm in and a bit of the villains in me. And that makes it more interesting too. Well, we have a question from one of your fans who happens to be a member of Blackstone staff who says, uh, one thing many of your characters seem to have in common is an internal drive to never give up. No matter how bad situations get, they persist until the job is done. Is that you or is there something about that character that attracts you, that sort of strong-willed character? That's not me. I'm a quitter. If things aren't working for me, I'll generally get pretty depressed and give up. I mean, you have no idea how many chapter ones of novels I have in my drawer. I think there's about 20 of them where I'll write chapter one and think it's the best thing I've ever written and leave it for a week and come back later and read it and just go, oh, my God, this is awful. And so <laughs> I'll give up and never look at that again and be embarrassed to even think about it. So I'm a quitter. But I think characters in books... If you have them quit or if you have them stop the investigation, especially detectives, it's going to be a fairly tedious book for the second half. So you have to keep them slogging through. And then the question you have to ask yourself was, why are they slogging through? And I think the question with Duffy is this. Ultimately, he's got nothing else but his professionalism. His personal life is not going that well. His emotional life is a wreck. And I think that if it wasn't for his professionalism, for his work ethic, then he would just be a complete mess. And so that's the one tether that he holds on to in a society that's falling apart all around him. And with literally anarchy in the streets, the one thing that he has to hold to is that he's damn good at his job. So is this uh, truly the end of Sean Duffy and this memorable series? My next book is definitely not going to be a Sean Duffy book. I found this really strange, true story set in the South Seas in 1906 among a, a group of German nudists who fled Germany and set up this paradise civilization. And then on this paradise island in the South Pacific, there was a series of unexplained murders. And so that's going to be the next book, which is very, very interesting. And after that, I really have no idea. I, I quite enjoy the standalone format because when a reader is reading a standalone, they have literally no idea what's going to happen and whether the character, the detective or whoever, the protagonist, is going to make it to the end. And I, and I quite enjoy that format. Format. So um, maybe the Pacific book and then a few standalones and then we'll see what happens next. So do you find a difference for yourself in uh, preparing when you write a standalone versus a series? Oh, yeah. I enjoy standalones better, especially the ones where I've sketched out the original plan, but I'm not really sure at the ending. Because then when you're writing the book, you're surprised by what happens at the end. I love that. And then you go, oh, he died at the end. Well, they're not going to like that, but that's what the story demanded. So I quite enjoy a standalone. I'm not a big series guy. I'm not such a huge fan of series that go on to the 14th book or the 15th book. Although I have to say my favorite audiobooks of all time, The Exception Proves the Rule or the Patrick O'Brien audiobooks, there's 21 of those or 20 and a half of those and narrated by Patrick Tull. And um, I wish there was more. They could have written 40 of those and I would have been very, very happy to keep going reading those. 
So describe your writing process and how you've developed your style. Well, no one should copy my writing process if they want to be a writer. Ken Bruin, who's another friend of mine and a famous Irish writer, his process is is the one to copy. He gets up at 5.30 in the morning. He goes for a walk around Galway Town. And he comes back. He feeds the ducks. He has a cup of coffee. And 6 a.m. he sets down to write. And he works from 6 until 9 and gets the kids off to school, and that's him done for the day. And he writes a 1,000 words or 2,000 words every day. Uh, James Patterson has the same process. Patricia Cornwell has the same process. That is the process to be modeled, I believe. But that's not me at all. I get up groggy, unhappy, get the kids off to school, try and write, fail miserably, take the laptop to the coffee shop, look at the blank screen, get distracted, read the newspaper, try and write something, come back to the house thinking a change of pace will help. It doesn't. Read a book, watch TV, have a bath, try and write again, fail miserably, and then delightedly realize it's three o'clock and time to go get the kids from school. So (laughs) that's basically my process snatches here and there and then somehow miraculously at the end of a year a book gets written you've got a a good academic background i mean you study politics and philosophy at the university of oxford in england you've taught high school english when you research a book do you rely on on the library and internet or is it mostly from personal experience for for the duffy books a lot of it has come from memory just that time living in a small town called carrick fergus which is just five miles from the center of belfast and a lot of it has come from memories of the time and photographs and and just incidents that happened but i do love research there's nothing i like better than going to the library and and reading old books and old newspapers for one it's a very good uh, excuse not to write anything because you just say ah, it's a research day and so you just go off to the library and you read the old, all the old newspapers and it's fascinating and you read old books and you feel you've had a good productive day doing a research in fact i'd be very happy to spend the next five years just researching and not writing anything. That would be paradise for me. So when did you begin writing? I started, when I was living in Denver, I was teaching high school English, and I was teaching a lot of short story classes. I was telling the kids how easy it was to write a short story. And I said, look, you know, your lives are interesting. And it turned out to be true. Their lives were quite interesting. And I said, it's very easy. Just write about what you know. And then I thought, maybe I should be practicing what I preached because I'd lived in New York as an illegal immigrant for three years before getting married and and getting my green card. What happened was that I arrived in New York on the Wednesday, unemployed, freshly arrived in the city. And by Saturday night, I was pulling pints in a pub in the Bronx. Then I did that for the next three years, and I worked on building sites and construction sites with a lot of really dodgy characters who were mobbed up in a lot of places. I I worked with the Teamsters Union, and all these guys come out with all this fantastic free dialogue. And I thought to myself when I was living in Denver, you know, a few years later, maybe I could take all this free dialogue and all these stories and all these incidents and make a narrative out of it. And I wrote my first crime novel, which is Dead I Well May Be. And rather amazingly to me, I sent it to an agent. And the first agent I sent it to accepted it. And then he sent it to a publisher, and the first publisher that he sent it to accepted it. And that's how it began, almost by accident. Who has been your biggest influence as a writer? Oh, so many influences. When I was in high school, I discovered Cormac McCarthy, and I felt that I was the only person in Northern Ireland who had ever heard of him, especially his early Tennessee books, which are set among the Ulster Scots settlers of Tennessee and Kentucky. And I loved him. Uh, Stylistically, he's a very difficult writer to try and copy or to be influenced by, but I just loved Cormac McCarthy. And I grew up in the tradition of great English Writers like Evelyn Waugh and J.G. Ballard and P.G. Woodhouse. I love that. And I love putting comedy in my books, basically from that background. It was heavily influenced, of course, by the great Irish tradition. James Joyce, we all did in school, and Samuel Beckett, and Oscar Wilde. I loved his prose. And then after I came to America, I discovered all these guys that I'd, I'd never read before. Daniel Woodrell was a huge influence on me, the crime writer. And I still read... And whenever a new Daniel Woodrell novel comes out. And then it was only later that I discovered the Scottish noir, 
particularly Ian Rankin, and even more so perhaps Ian Banks. I loved his Scottish noir books and, and also his science fiction novels. Now, when you're not writing, what do you do to unwind? That's a good question. I love to read. I do. I read a lot of books. I love to go for walks. I walk the dog and I walk the neighbor's dog. Melbourne is a great walking city and I ride my bike a lot. And I ride my bike all over the city. It's a very flat city. You can ride all the way down the coast. And I know you're not supposed to do this, but I sneakily listen to a lot of audiobooks when I'm <laughs> riding my bike. You sometimes get told off for encouraging people to do that. But I ride on bike trails, so it's not that dangerous. I do do that a lot. What type of audiobooks do you enjoy listening to? I'm very eclectic. I'm an audible reader and I, I have downpour on my iPod as well. The last book I listened to was Longbourn, which is the Pride and Prejudice from the Servant's Perspective by Joe Baker. I just listened to a, a book by this quantum physicist at MIT called Max Tegmark. He wrote a book on, on quantum theory. And I read this steampunk novel, which I loved, called The Strange Affair of spring Jack. That's narrated by my narrator, Jared Doyle. I basically read a lot of different genres and types of audiobooks. Well, what was it like listening to Gerard Doyle's audiobook version of your work? I thought he was very good. I said to him afterwards, oh, I didn't know you could do a Yorkshire accent. I'm going to do a lot more Yorkshire characters in my book. Because he did an excellent not Yorkshire accent in that book. I was only used to his Irish accents. Sir Richard Francis Burton is the hero of this steampunk novel. And he did a very good sort of um, upper class English colonial diplomat accent. And then he did a very good Yorkshire accent. So I'm going to give him more accent challenges and to see how he responds. Shifting media, the uh, Cold Gold Ground and Dead I Well May Be uh, have both been optioned for television. Uh, any idea what actor you would like to see play your characters? That's a good question. I think for the Cold Gold Ground, what were they talking about? They wanted an older Irish actor. For me, my ideal actor would be Michael Fassbender, but I think he's gotten too big to do TV. You know who I thought of for the Cold Cold Ground as well? Daniel Radcliffe's dad is from Northern Ireland. And I saw Daniel Radcliffe doing his father's accent, and it was extraordinary. He was like this, right there, how's it going? This is how my dad speaks. And I was just going, wow. And I saw him playing Allen Ginsberg in that film, Kill Your Darlings. And I thought, wow, Daniel Radcliffe would be fantastic in this. You know, if Michael Fassbender is too big and Daniel Radcliffe is looking to change direction, this might be the perfect vehicle for him. And as for Dead I Well May Be, when they thought about doing it as a film about three or four years ago, now they've, they've switched to thinking about doing it as a TV series. When they thought about doing it as a film, they had Colin Farrell in mind. And I don't know if that's still the plan or whether they have someone else that they're thinking of. I read on your wiki page that you played loose head prop forward for the Jerusalem Lions rugby team, which right there sounds like the setup for a book. That was a fantastic year. My wife got a Fulbright to go to um, live in Israel for a year. And by the nature of the Fulbright, I was a spouse and I wasn't allowed to work. And so we moved to Jerusalem and I had to find something to do with my time. I was a tour guide for a while, which was really ridiculously cheeky because I I basically arrived in the city a week earlier, and I was taking tourists around the old city and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and things like that. But then I discovered the Jerusalem Lions, and it was a semi-professional team of rugby players, and I showed up at training camp. The, the team had just got started, and I said, look, I used to play rugby in high school. Are you looking for players? And they were just flabbergasted. They said, you actually know the rules? And I was going, yes. And they said, you can play? And I goes, yes, said, you've got the job. So I basically got the job as their loose head prop forward. And the, the loose head prop is the guy at the front of the scrum. I don't know if you know how rugby works, but it's the when the two groups of people meet. It's when the heads clash at the front. And so I played loose head prop forward for them for a year. And I got, I got a small fee. I think it was like 60 shekels a game, which was about $10 or $20 or something like that, plus a laundry allowance and plus a travel allowance. And I played games all over Jerusalem and all over um, Israel. I think we went down to Egypt once and we took the bus across the Sinai into Egypt. And the most intense game we ever played was we went up to South Lebanon. And there's this UN contingent called UNIFIL, and it was the Fijian army. The Fijian army were in their UN blue helmets, and they, of course, the Fijians are mad rugby players. They love rugby. 
and we played them and that was a nightmare because the Fijians are enormous and we were a bunch of skinny guys from <laughs> Jerusalem. So we see these huge Fijians who were all six foot six, 250, 300 pounds, you know, when we were playing in this little scratch rugby field in South Lebanon. And the first thing they told us before the game started was, if the hooter sounds, we all have to get off the field and go into the bomb shelter because it's probably Hezbollah firing rockets from South Lebanon into Israel. And it says, which is fine, but sometimes the rockets fall short. And so don't be shy about running into the uh, bomb shelter. And I said to the guy, oh, don't worry. I won't be shy about running into the bomb shelter if the hooter sounds. And so we played the Fijian army and they crushed us. I remember that score was about 75 to nothing. Once they get running, how do you stop a 300-pound Fijian? Sometimes there'd be like three or four little guys hanging off him, and it was, he would just keep going. It was like Gulliver being attacked by the Lilliputians. It was ridiculous. So, so that was a very, very funny game. Any chance that experience is ever going to show up in one of your novels? I should. I mean, that would be so funny. I've thought about a memoir or putting that in somehow, but I just haven't found the right vehicle for that story. But that was definitely the craziest rugby game of my life and uh, one of the craziest years of my life, too. One last question before I let you go, and this is probably the most uh, serious. It's from a fan here. Who drafts the best Guinness? Who drafts the best Guinness? Well, first of all, you have to have it in Dublin. I'm sorry, but Guinness does not travel well. So you have to have it made from Liffey water. I don't even think the Guinness in Belfast is that good. Um, so you have to have it in Dublin. You have to have it of Liffey water. And you probably should have it in the Temple Bar, which this is this area south of Dublin, where they have very, very good pours of Guinness. I would get there in the afternoon rather than the evening when the barman has a little bit more time. They used to say, if you get your pint of Guinness in less than five minutes, the barman's not doing a good job because uh, a pint of Guinness should be poured about a third of the way up and then it should settle and the barman should chat to you about life or maybe give you a tip on the horse racing. And then he should pour the next third and then he should talk to you more about life and give you some more horse racing tips. And then finally, he should pour the head. And so the whole process should be this long, engaging dialogue between you and your bar person, and it should take about six minutes. And if you get a shamrock on the head, send it back. You know that's just for the tourists. And if it comes with a beautiful head, which is about half an inch tall, and it's taken a while, and you've had a nice experience before the pour, you know you'll get an expert pint of Guinness. The Zen of Guinness. It sounds like a good philosophy for life. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Adrian. This has been a great interview. Thanks very much for having me. And we're very excited about the upcoming audiobook release of In the Morning, I'll Be Gone. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this Downpour.com interview with Adrian McKinty. You can find In the Morning, I'll Be Gone, as well as book one and two in the Troubles trilogy, The Cold, Cold Ground, And I Hear the Sirens in the Street, along with many of Adrian McKinty's other titles and all of Blackstone Audio's audiobooks at downpour.com.